Okay. Good. Let's continue with the applications. And it's my great pleasure to introduce my closest colleague, Oscar Kamera, working together here with us in the, in, in the group in the UPF. And he has been working for years and years also on modeling and especially focusing on electrophysiological modeling <coughs> with a big emphasis in trying to go towards the patients. It's like not so much the modeling aspect as such, but trying to create tools so that electrophysiologies in reality can try to both understand patient better, look at data in a more integrated way, and at <coughs> some point try to use VPH technologies in order to improve or come up with new therapies. Please, Oscar. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so don't worry, just this talk and the next one, you will be free. Uh, so as Bar said, I'm Oscar Camara, I'm an associate professor here at UPF and I co-supervise together with Bart the Fison Group. And I'm supposed to talk about uh, cardiac electrophysiological modeling. So let me explain you a bit the story uh, behind it. So a regular day in Fison's, the two of us close together. Uh, and then Bart uh, explained some things about, uh, well, I'm going to help Jerome to organize whatever. Summer School VPH and well, I was really surprised. Like Bart is always with the rubbish and bullshit word, especially with VPH things. And they say, no, no, it's a good idea because we need to organize whatever events for cardio function. And I went, what? Cardio what? Um, uh, and then, well, whatever, I mean too complicated for you, bloody Spanish, always the same. But we could have a Catalan beer testing. Then that changed a lot of things. Um, <laughs> And they say, okay, you want to help? No way. I mean, no way I want to help. But, okay, at least you need to give a talk. Okay, well, let's see. No? Um, and then uh, some weeks passed, and last week I was checking uh, the program, and I see uh, cardiac electrophysiological modeling. And I say, what? Uh, <laughs> do I need to talk about cardiac electrophysiological modeling? Really? In this program? VPH? No way. Am I, am I an expert on cardiac electrophysiological model? No way, just ask anyone in the community. It's a really interesting community, uh, basically uh, meeting every one year and a half in the cardiac physiom uh, events. And you can ask anyone uh, there, and a lot of these names will come up. Uh, big communities in France, in Oxford, uh, in New Zealand, in the US also, etc., And a lot of people here, really nice people, most of them, um, then seriously, I know most of them, uh, but we'll see why. Uh, because, I mean, I had, uh, I mean, one thing it was, okay, Bart is not really good organizing things, so maybe he was wrong. Uh, because I started and my background was on image processing. My PhD, I did it in Paris, um, uh, on image processing, non rigid registration in oncological applications between CT and nuclear medicine images. And then I moved to London uh, for modeling Alzheimer's disease, the effect of Alzheimer's disease in brain structures. Uh, but then uh, why I've been in the Cardiac Physium Conference uh, during the last year, I mean, four of the last five. Uh, in fact, I was here in this picture also. Uh, Besides traveling, I mean, this is really nice places for traveling, I think it reflects well how the community is changing over the years. Um, I wasn't the only one. Huh? I wasn't the only one without a proper or a traditional uh, EP modeling background uh, in this conference. People like Alistair Young, Pablo Lamata, Kawal, etc are often in these conferences. And it's really related to what Blanca was explaining the other day that I like a lot. Uh, his more or less uh, philosophical uh, papers on um, this interplay between modeling and experiments uh, on how you really uh, need to think that modeling is not anymore just for modelers. It needs to be an interdisciplinary effort. And you need to start forgetting, or the community needs to start forgetting, uh, like uh, these people like say, no, we need to trust the data because the models are not good enough. Uh, and the other way around, I mean, the modelers say the data is too noisy for the perfect models. 
I have heard at some point some modelers saying, okay, I'm sorry, we need to change the data because my model is right. Uh, so these things don't lead uh, anywhere. Uh, so we need to change this over and over. Uh, and this is one part. And the other part in particular in cardiac electrophysiology is that a lot of people have been working for years and years uh, in, at the microscopic level. Um, but I, like everything in nature, in particular the human body, it's a multi-scale problem. And, and we have uh, to deal with what is happening at the cellular level, even at the protein level, but also go into the different scales at tissue level and organ level and even systemic level. And this is changing over the years. Oh, sorry. Uh, and this is changing over the years. Um, but it always, uh, it, everything started with Alison Noble and, and these people working and developing in the 60s the first uh, cardiac electrophysiological models at the cellular level. And then also there were really uh, very good initiatives led by Peter Hunter, etc., like CellML, to share. Uh, these models also, the kind of a standard monodomain and bidomain propagation, uh, tissue propagation models, that this is quite particular to cardiac. I mean, being, having work in different fields like the neuro field, you see that in this respect, the brain modeling is far from having this knowledge in terms of um, standard models to use. Uh, and also the problem is that most clinicians work at the microscopic level. I mean, their measurements uh, dealing with patients, they are basically working at the microscopic level. Uh, why these people have not been working uh, until recently at the organ level? This is, well, I mean, some ideas. It's just the difficulty uh, to get uh, good data. Uh, also, uh, having models and simulations at the organ scale and including the different scales is very difficult and very time consuming. And as Bart was saying before, I mean, quite often you don't have the data for all patients. So that's uh, problematic. And the problem is that historically, all this uh, cardiac EP modeling has been quite far from clinical, clinical routine. Uh, but this has evolved dramatically during the last, let's say, 10 years or so. Uh, because there has been better and better imaging and signal acquisition systems. Uh, in clinical routine, not just in particular big hospitals, research, research hospitals. Also, uh, very helpful open source initiatives to share codes, uh, to share uh, models, and, and also uh, the advent and the use of computational resources. We saw in the talk of Mariano how now it's uh, relatively easy to get access to high-performing computing that helps a lot. Um, to speed up things. Uh, so with all this culture, I was in London uh, at some point and I met Maxim. Uh, and the first thing, the first day I arrived to KCL, he showed me kind of a really nasty video on the acquisition of optical mapping uh, of a dog heart in an open chest surgery. It was so nasty that it was really nice. Um, so then after several beers and, and parties, etc., we decided, okay, maybe apart from beers, we should we could start doing things together. So I started to help him uh, doing some image processing uh, for the modeling projects he was working on. Uh, basically, I was doing a stupid, uh, a fine registration. He was doing the hard part on trying to uh, construct a data assimilation uh, pipeline in order to estimate uh, different conductivities in the heart. And this is already uh, 10 years ago, Max. Um, so. Uh, then I came back to Barcelona in 2007, and since then, really, I kind of uh, forgot a bit the image processing side, or, or just a couple this with a bit of the uh, going to the clinic uh, more and more often, in particular locally, uh, to hospital clinic and work with electrophysiologists, uh, but also being involved in large uh, European uh, projects, UHART and VP2HF. Um, so kind of my objective, the objective of my research has just gone towards really trying to develop computational pipelines and really using uh, the part of the data processing and also the modeling as well. And, and that's true. I mean, in the end, uh, the main goal is try to help the clinicians to better understand 
some particular clinical questions that's quite important to, to focus, uh, and to optimize some of the therapies and give them uh, better tools for uh, the, to, to support them, the, the clinical decisions they need uh, to make. And a lot of them related to cardiac electrophysiology. So in fact, well, Bart wasn't that wrong. The problem is that I need to talk about this after Blanca, a uh, really nice talk, and after 150 slides of Maxim. Um, so, and on top of this is the last day, so everyone is super tired, uh, and he insists me, you need to do it, all cardio function seniors will present, so this is what I'm doing. Uh, but no equation, just money congos. Money congos is just nice pictures. Um, and obviously, uh, Bart needed to pay for this, so um, in the talk, we see that. Um, so just a disclaimer, so cardiac electrophysiological modeling, but with a subtitle, huh? someone that is not really a modeler, image processing background, and just trying to integrate uh, this microscopic patient data into models and use models, not really develop them. Just talk to people that really are developing these, these models. Um, you've seen different schemes on how we can go to image-based uh, cardiac models these days. Uh, as always, uh, you really need to start from getting uh, nice images and data from patients, uh, do image processing in order to stack uh, patient-specific representation in terms of a mesh, and then add the uh, solvers and the models, the mathematical models that replicate some of the physical phenomena, uh, in this case in the heart, and then trying to well, extract um, additional information that is not given by, by the data. Uh, the thing is, nowadays we have a lot of information that you could, you could input into the model. And it's not very easy, even for the clinician, for an expert, to really uh, handle all, all this deluge of, of data and know how to interpret and even to communicate to other specialists or even to the patient. And even if we just look at the, uh, at the, um, at the imaging site, we have, uh, I mean, a lot of different uh, imaging modalities nowadays they can provide very useful complementary information from echo to CT, MR, or different modalities of MR information about the structure and function. But all this needs to be properly integrated if we want uh, to <coughs> make the models uh, useful, really, at the, at the organ level. And models in terms of the different physical phenomena in the heart, from the electrophysiology to the, uh, to, to the mechanics and, and to the flow. <clears throat> so basically these three important steps, not just the modeling, uh, but first extract the relevant biomarkers and indices from the data, then integrate them in a proper way, including uncertainty, including uh, what to do when you have uh, contradictory information between different modalities, etc. Uh, so I'm going to start uh, explaining uh, some examples. Uh, out of these uh, three parts. Not really a lot on the data processing because uh, this was the job of Matthew the other day. Um, so just to remember that in terms of the image processing, once you get the raw data uh, from an image uh, of the patient, you need to just recognize some uh, structures, uh, the relevant structures in them, different techniques, atlas based, etc. Uh, other things very important is just to extract uh, shape indices, to extract uh, deformation indices uh, in order to have a better overview of, of the, the patient's heart. Uh, also, we've been involved uh, a lot in the signal processing with a group of Pablo Laguna and Juan Pablo Martinez in Zaragoza uh, in order to better uh, extract information and better process, uh, in this case, electroanatomical data uh, that, as Max was mentioning before, is quite used uh, during interventions, radio frequency ablations to guide the intervention. And to be honest, the commercial systems these days, the, the signal processing is very, very basic. So there is a lot of room for improvement in here to have better, better data. I won't go more in detail into this, but we are now having a pattern on some of the techniques here that uh, the clinicians are very happy about it. Um, so we need to construct what sometimes is called like a digital patient or patient avatar, where we can integrate 
uh, patient-specific information from images, signals, etc., but ideally also uh, population-based information, uh, information that can come from the clinical guidelines, uh, information that uh, doesn't necessarily need to be in a nice uh, image format, but also uh, everything related uh, to reports and guidelines need to be, to some extent, integrated there. I will just touch uh, the integration of, of the imaging here, but it needs to be uh, considered. Um, so the first example, uh, this is uh, the work mainly of David Soto, that uh, hopefully will defend his PhD in September. And Maxim also has talked about uh, VTs, so I won't go into detail, but obviously this is uh, quite often related to heterogeneity of the scar uh, in the left ventricle mainly. And it's very important to uh, extract or to get information about the heterogeneity of this scar in terms of core zone, that is uh, tissue that really uh, doesn't conduct a lot anymore, and border zone that is kind of a mix between healthy and, and, and that tissue that is still conducts but allow it velocities. Um, and that are supposedly uh, the reasons of, of the arrhythmias. So at the hospital clinic in the unit of arrhythmias, uh, in particular uh, Antonio Berrezo, uh, they've been uh, during the last years developing uh, optimized techniques for ablating uh, these cases and rather that ablating the whole scar that it was kind of the standard procedure until not long ago, just try to analyze uh, the, core, uh, the border zone that, I mean, is quite challenging. You need to be really uh, an expert on this to uh, visualize uh, these conduction channels of uh, gray zone or border zone, and then ablate uh, just the entrances of these channels so that you kind of uh, induce a short circuit and then you stop the uh, uh, electrical reentries. The problem is that, yeah, this is not a potato. This is supposed to be a heart, but it looks more a potato. Uh, and then uh, this is quite difficult to interpret. Uh, in kind of uh, research hospitals, what they are using is just this image-guided uh, ablation, VT ablation, where they acquire a preoperative MR image, the lane enhancement, where they can get information uh, about tissue properties, uh, really where is the scar and the, the heterogeneity of the scar. But obviously we are talking about data that is acquired before the intervention and that it looks like a heart, and data that is acquired uh, during the intervention and it looks like a potato. So in order to integrate this, uh, the clinician needs to do it a bit in uh, his or her brain, and it's quite complex. So what David has been developing together with Costa, a postdoc in our lab uh, during the last years, is kind of uh, an integration of these uh, two types of data. Uh, and it's basically uh, based on a mapping in, of the 3D data into a 2D, uh, 2D, 2D disk, um, where uh, we can flatten the left ventricle with uh, a Laplacian conformal mapping. Uh, so what we did was to really analyze uh, and compare with the standard, uh, with the state-of-the-art integration techniques uh, on synthetic data. We generated kind of simulated electroanatomical maps and a real data. Uh, so basically, you can see here uh, the process. We did it for the endocardium and for the epicardium. And you can see from the 3D, you need to select some landmarks to guide this mapping and you go from the original 3D to flattening the, um, the structural anatomy of the left ventricle and here both ventricles into these maps. And obviously you can do this with whatever that looks like a kind of left ventricle, even if it's more potato-like shape. Uh, you can see this animated, that is uh, funnier. And you can see that while we need to do some readjustments in the end just to put the apex at the center, but this uh, process is quite nice because from the 2D disk you can get back to the 3D without losing uh, a lot of information. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, we tested on, on synthetic data uh, and well, we were quite happy because our methods, kind of this landmark uh, QCM, 
work a lot better than the other standard techniques, including rigid registration or even including non-rigid registration based on currents, uh, because basically uh, there were not constraints uh, imposed on this non-rigid deformation. So that was good for different uh, scars. Uh, so we were quite happy to have better overlap measures between uh, the um, between the scars. This was a synthetic scar in green, uh, the conduction channels in post. And not just the overall overlap, but we developed uh, a set of indices to analyze locally the conduction channels in terms of the position of the entrance and exit of the conduction channels and also the continuity of the conduction channels. Uh, because some methods, uh, for instance, these are the two more or less used now uh, in clinical routine these days, sometimes you lose uh, the continuity of the conduction channel and this is not good. Uh, we tested on several cases, uh, real cases, and this is a lot more challenging uh, to, to evaluate because of the noisy nature of the data. But well, we were quite happy to see that um, these green dots come from the cartel information, cartel data, and are supposedly uh, the places where you have double potential, so candidates for being a channel. And when we were applying our integration technique, most of them were really onto what it was the conduction channels. And depending on which technique you were using, I mean, points were going everywhere, not really following the conduction channel. So we were quite happy uh, about these results. But it's still very challenging to apply in, in routinely in, in the clinic. We also applied uh, similar techniques uh, with experimental data. Here it just uh, some experiments that uh, we were involved in hospital clinic for several years with pigs. Quite challenging to work with these pigs. At some point they were fibrillating and legs were just jumping, etc. Um, here we have an electrophysiologist doing uh, or acquiring electrophysiological data. Here we have an echocardiographer acquiring uh, mechanical data or deformation data. The VET, Gemma super scare here, uh, engineers, and there was quite a setup. And the nice thing is that we got a lot of data. In fact, to these uh, peaks, we had preoperative structural image, an MR, uh, but also, uh, we acquired, uh, when at baseline state, we acquired uh, electrical and mechanical data of, of the peak. Then we induce an electrical problem, an LBBB, a left on the branch block. And then we, again, acquired uh, this mechanical and electrophysiological data. And then we implanted a CRT device, kind of pacemaker, um, to see which, what was the effect of the uh, electrical abnormality and uh, to which extent this was corrected together with the mechanical abnormality with the device. So that means a lot of data. And David applied this kind of 2D conformal mapping uh, to this data because we were having a very heterogeneous data, meaning at different time points with different resolution, and we needed to integrate them in a common reference space. So this to disk was quite useful. So we got endo, epi data, basal, uh, LBBB with the device implanted. We could just go for from this 2D to a kind of a 3D bullseye plot, and then extract indices from this data and compare data at different time points and even between different cases. Uh, we could get kind of videos of the activation propagation at the different stages to see how the propagation at baseline is quite different from when you have a block of conduction, an LBBB, or when the CRT is implanted. And we could uh, also quantify kind of this uh, interventricular and intraventricular delays with kind of these histograms of isochrons. So we are in the process of analyzing all this data. Uh, that's quite challenging. It's a lot of data, uh, and we have a lot of different markers, and we are trying to analyze um, the relation between this uh, pattern of electrical activation to where the leads of the CRT device were implanted. Because there are some, uh, some positions that are better than others. We also had peaks with SCAR and without the SCAR. So, I mean, we're analyzing these this, uh, differences. 
Uh, also, together with Siemens, with Thomas Romancy, they are using this data to validate uh, their uh, electromechanical simulations, uh, and they are trying to uh, predict the CRT electrical activation patterns uh, once the model is personalized uh, either at baseline or at LBDB. Um, and results are quite uh, promising. It's kind of data simulation process with different parameters, and we are trying different parameters to better have this data simulation done. Um, in addition, uh, not just the left ventricle and the right ventricle, we are trying to apply kind of a similar strategy that we like to flatten things um, to the atria as well. And we have very preliminary results and to some extent it's a lot more challenging because of the pulmonary veins, because of the left atrial appendage. Um, so we try to construct this um, kind of circular disc for the atria also, but at the moment, is quite dependent on the registration phase between a given template we have and, and the new atria we want to, uh, we want to analyze. Uh, but we have, well, interesting results uh, comparing CARTO, uh, preoperative, uh, let's say, fibrosis uh, after uh, the ablation and the CARTO during the ablation. Uh, more things to come in the next, in the next months. Uh, <coughs> so this is a bit of the integration, and once we have more or less the data in the same common reference space, we need to build this reference space structurally for the, for the models. Um, and I like it, uh, this slide that I stole from, from Rafa, Rafael Sebastián uh, in Valencia, because this was showing a bit of what it was some years ago, uh, and not even that long ago. I remember conversations kind of 10, 15 years ago with people using ellipsoid for us as the approximation of the um, of the of the anatomical structure of the heart and for some questions it's okay but if you really want to go to very specific uh, patient uh, modeling it's a bit limited depending on the question nowadays or more recently we get more and more uh, uh, information from the images and higher higher resolution uh, data, then this is reflected to better uh, anatomical definition uh, in the models. Um, once we have the anatomy, we need to complement uh, the, uh, whatever we extract from the image with information you cannot extract from the images that are more related to superstructural uh, uh, information or even with function. Uh, so then we start from, from the imaging, we generate kind of a segmentation, we generate a surface mesh, uh, but again, we have a lot of limitations still. You often see very, very smooth left ventricles when this is not reality, really. Uh, this surface mesh, more or less, it's done in a standard way, uh, but with some kind of uh, dilemmas, we'll see in a minute. And then you go to a volumetric mesh, and depending on how you do, you can end up with very, uh, uh, very uh, expensive computationally meshes if you want to solve all your equations at every node of this, of this mesh. Uh, once you have the model construct, you kind of add additional information uh, based on experimental models, etc., uh, like the Purkinje system, the fibers, or the SCAR information. Uh, and just starting by kind of this meshing, uh, kind of meshing dilemma, it depends on the families. Kind of the French people like Salot de Toedra, whatever, uh, and the UK and kind of um, New Zealand, they like a lot Exaedra. Uh, well, I mean, it's always one week ago we uh, were still discussing about this, uh, what is better. So, well, I guess it depends on the application, it depends on, on what, which properties you prefer of, of these meshes. Uh, for the hexahedral meshes, these are very, very nice meshes to work with, quite regular, but they are, they are very, very difficult to construct with uh, human organs. Uh, it's not always easy to fit kind of this nice hexahedra into a real uh, human anatomy. And there are some people like Andre McCollum that they just push very hard the maths to really construct hexahedral meshes in complex structures like the atria. Um, but well, 
uh, the other family of people, uh, it's just kind of building tetrahedral meshes where they are more flexible, they need to be, uh, well, they can be better fit to data, but then they are less regular. Uh, and in VP2HF, a European project, we are working, uh, people from KCL, they spent one year and a half just developing um, a pipeline, a computational pipeline to construct these tetrahedral meshes automatically from, from data. Uh, and this was quite challenging really kind of more development uh, work than research to some extent, but really needed because this was one of the uh, main bottlenecks uh, to bring simulations into the clinic. We'll see later. These are some examples of these meshes generated by KCL people on really patient-specific um, information from images. Um, and then, quite important, this superstructural information to understand what's going on in the heart, maybe a bit farther from clinical applications, but still. Um, I was mentioning these smooth ventricles, but reality is not like that. I mean, this is just some examples when you see the trabeculation in the endocardial walls, and when you simulate uh, left ventricular anatomy smooth, probably you will get errors. Uh, when you simulate flow, at some point mechanics, at some point electrophysiology, you need to be very cautious uh, on the assumptions you make. Uh, well, this is just uh, some data from high-resolution MRI or synchrotron that uh, some people in our group generated, and you really see how complex is this uh, structure. Just imagine this full of blood, and then with a catheter inside trying to touch a wall. So that's quite uh, challenging to, to model. Um, so, just commenting a bit on the fiber orientation. Maxim has uh, main comment this in terms of the acquisition. These are some uh, and how relevant uh, fiber orientation is uh, for modeling, for modeling electrophysiology and for modeling uh, mechanics of the heart. Um, and while there are a lot of kind of histological data where you can see the different uh, fiber orientations depending on where you are looking at, the endocardial wall, the picardial wall, the left ventricle, and the, ven the, uh, the right ventricle, etc. These are images from Damian Sanchez Quintana in Extremadura. Uh, and there are some uh, kind of data that uh, some are believers, some not, uh, based on MR, uh, DTI, MRI, uh, ex vivo, uh, most of the time, from canine hearts, from human hearts, there are also data. Uh, in where people have been quite active in this field. Uh, we are trying to get this information from higher resolution data, from synchrotron also. Um, <coughs> and then, as uh, Maxim was mentioning, this pioneering work on in vivo DTI, even if it's at some uh, slices. So there are some data there. And, and so we were trying to answer in one particular clinical question when we realized that we needed to look into fibers really properly. Uh, and this uh, clinical question uh, was related to better understand the outflow tract ventricular arrhythmias um, and try to generate uh, a computational modeling pipeline uh, to replicate what the clinicians see depending on the site of origin of the ectopic, ectopic fork site uh, of these arrhythmias. And and in fact, in these arrhythmias, uh, it can have a left ventricle origin or a right ventricle origin. And based on the standard ECG data, it's not possible in a lot of cases to distinguish if it's coming from the left or from the right, because the outflow tracks, they are really close together physically. So really, you cannot distinguish properly in the ECG data. And then it means that the radiofrequency ablation interventions can be very, very long. They go to the right, they try to burn, uh, rhythm is still is there, they go to the left, um, maybe sometimes does nothing happens. So it can be really, really long procedures and quite painful. Uh, so the idea is, well, let's try to do some uh, EP modeling and on a whatever geometry, one heart we had uh, in, the, in the lab, um, and just put different sites of origin and see how in the left ventricle and how this arrived to the outflow track of the uh, right ventricle. Uh, with a standard kind of detailed models, uh, tentusure, et cetera. And, and then 
we show this to the clinicians and they say exactly this is what I see in the data. When uh, we have uh, the origin and the non coronary cusp, while the propagation arrives around here, a bit farther from the red, uh, uh, farther from the outflow tract, when it's the L cusp, it arrives from this exact side, et cetera, et cetera. This it was even presented in a, as a poster in a clinical conference, so we were quite happy uh, to get the clinicians believing in this simulation. And then uh, we kind of compare quant uh, qualitatively our results in terms of some parameters of these simulations with the literature, and they were more or less agreeing uh, to some extent in terms of the areas of the uh, isochrons, etc. Uh, so we say, okay, let's go to uh, process some real cases with these pathologies. And we started with three uh, cases that they were really awful in terms of the quality of the data. The potatoes uh, in Carto were really potatoes and data re really, really noisy. And then the first thing we realized is that we needed to segment the geometry. Uh, well, we, we set up kind of the whole pipeline like image process, image generation, parameter setting, and simulations in comparison with the CARTO data. And then the first problem is that main uh, segmentation techniques, automatic segmentation techniques based on atlases, uh, they don't reach the outflow tracks. So we needed to, I mean, a PhD in our group, Ruben, really very painfully, manually, uh, with the help of some undergraduate students to segment all these outflow tracks, et cetera. We use a slicer for this and have manu manual corrections uh, and have well, good results, but quite uh, computationally expensive. Then to construct the mesh was also very painful uh, because of the thin layer, uh, structural uh, layer in the outflow tracks. Uh, so a lot of kind of uh, manual corrections with Blender, et cetera. Uh, but in the end we got kind of nice uh, meshes, and then we needed to incorporate fibers. And fibers, okay, well, you can use standard rule-based methods like a streeter, like Bayer, more recent one, or fit whatever uh, DTA data you may have. Uh, the problem of these fiber models and fiber data that is that all of them, they mostly look at the left ventricle, and we needed information, good information of the fibers in the right ventricle. In fact, we talked with the kind of anatomist um, to get this kind of histological uh, data, and we saw that, well, uh, the epicardium, kind of this streeter model, rule-based models work fine, uh, to, uh, uh, yeah, work fine, but then when we were looking at the endocardial right ventricle, something was wrong, because these models are given kind of quite circumferential uh, fibers where uh, when, I mean, when we see at the histological data, fibers here are quite longitudinal, and in fact, uh, it looks like we have two types of fibers, one going from the apex to the pulmonary valve and one to the tricuspid valve. Uh, so we said, okay, well, let's change this fiber model to make it more realistic at the RV. Uh, so we are trying to modify kind of the Bayer uh, rule-based uh, models defining uh, kind of some directions or a reference system with some directions uh, by solving the Laplace equation with some uh, kind of landmarks uh, that all these kind of uh, reference system in the hard fiber uh, reference system, they allow us to define some angles and to play with these angles to define the different fiber orientations. And then we are kind of defining one direction going from the apex to the pulmonary and one to the tricuspid valve. We are now in the process to compare these results qualitatively with histological data, uh, and also, well, we can see that we got, uh, we have imposed longitudinal directions here, uh, and we are comparing uh, with all the data we may have, a Streeter, Bayer, DTI, etc. and, I mean, there are some, some difference. Um, okay, uh, and then the next step is once you have this model, try to see the influence of these models or these fiber models into the final simulations. If a particular fiber model, uh, it's making simulations closer to uh, the CARTO maps. The issue these days is that these CARTO maps are not very good, but we are seeing differences in terms of the uh, electrical propagation, obviously. So now we are in the process, we have better cases, six new cases that we need to process this base and to really assess what is going on there in terms of the fiber models. 
In the Purkinje, uh, it's another very important superstructural information. Uh, quite often in modeling, uh, we have these fast electrical pathways not really modeled uh, at the structural level. And well, we had some papers that showing that depending on the question you want to answer for some uh, problems like CRT, it may have an influence and that you need to consider really the structural Purkinje. Uh, so Rafa Sebastian, he developed some uh, techniques to generate these trees based on uh, L-based uh, systems or L-systems. The problem is that you could generate really nice uh, images and figures and trees, but I mean, was this realistic or not? Who knows? Uh, so he worked uh, a lot. We needed more control. I mean, this could grow uh, in whatever way. So we needed uh, to really uh, assimilate some data uh, in order to control uh, these models and, and to control some parameters of this model and that make uh, simulations or oh, the Purkinje, the structure of Purkinje more realistic. And we use this, uh, well, we also look uh, into this at the microscopic level in a collaboration with Frank Saxe in Utah. Uh, and while well, we did some image processing to analyze this with graph theory measurements, uh, the Purkinje network. Uh, all this information was embedded in a way, uh, in a model, in order to extract uh, information of the Purkinje tree directly from carton maps. Because this Purkinje tree, the problem is that you cannot really measure it in vivo. So we were kind of analyzing these activation maps with kind of uh, gradients, uh, divergence, to detect some critical points and then use geodesics to construct uh, the Purkinje tree. We tried with simulated data and even with three cases of uh, uh, ventricular tachycardia, fascicular ventricular car tachycardia related to anomalies in, in the Purkinje system. And we were quite really surprised to see that, well, I mean, even with very sparse conduction uh, Purkinje trees, we were getting uh, reasonable simulation results. Um, tissue characterization, another point uh, of um, important to take into account. So this is not a kebab, this is a heart of a human that was explanted because the heart was really bad, in bad shape. Um, and we need to, we want to use uh, information at the histological level to validate what is available at the, uh, in the MRI, what we see in vivo in the MRI. So we acquired uh, an in vivo MRI before uh, the, explant, the explant process. And then uh, we send this heart, we conserve it in formal, et cetera. We send it to uh, uh, Damian Sachit Quintana in Extremadura that he did uh, a bit of Carpaccio uh, with it. Um, with this microtome uh, system. Uh, and then all these things that you see coming out, it's just very thin slices of the heart that goes through a kind of a staining process in order to get really nice histological images, a lot of 2D slices. Uh, the really painful work we needed to do is to reconstruct all these slices back in 3D to compare with the MRI. Uh, so David, very fond on flattening things, so he used this kind of flattening technique in order to build a common reference space for the histology and for the 3D data. And results are really, really good really promising. We can really compare point by point uh, the in vivo uh, MRI information with the histology. And this is uh, being very helpful to determine uh, a lot of parameters and how reliable is the information of the scar and the heterogeneity of the scar in the, uh, in the MRI. Uh, and we are in the process of, of doing this uh, analysis. Um, so, okay, but what about really clinical routine? Uh, so you have all the tools now or a lot of background to see, okay, is it being used in clinical routine? In 2008, we had this UHAR project um, where one of the main goals or the main goal was really to do that, to, to have computational techniques, including modeling uh, for all these big objectives large consortium, a lot of money, a lot of years, hospitals, companies, etc. I mean, very structured, uh, very well structured uh, project. So what could possibly go wrong? Uh, what happened after uh, the end of the project, 2012? 
In terms of computational techniques, researchers, we were very happy. We had a lot of publications, a lot of advanced technical advances in data processing, in modeling, and clinicians were super sad. Why? Because everything was applied to a very limited amount of data. In four years, uh, Maxim managed to have two patients, and uh, this was even in 2013, we got eight patients. So clinicians were saying, look guys, I mean, we cannot do clinical trials on the, with this. Uh, and I mean, what happened? What happened here? So this is, I say, a speculation. But large consortiums are quite difficult to work with. Data wasn't good enough, or it wasn't acquired for the purpose that we wanted uh, for the modeling. Uh, computational models weren't advanced enough. We didn't have maybe fast enough computational techniques, uh, computation, limited computational resources, even not very clear and concrete uh, clinical questions. And, and even clinicians, they didn't know at all what the simulation was. And maybe we a uh, bit oversold the product. <coughs> oh, sorry. But things are definitely uh, improving. Uh, when you see kind of people like this Japanese, that some years ago nobody knew who they were, and they even had, they, they weren't publishing, they didn't care at all uh, to publish. The website was in Japanese, so it was impossible with nice pictures, but you didn't know what happened there. And, oops, animations are a bit destroyed here. So, uh, I'm sorry. The thing is, these Japanese, uh, now they are publishing a lot. Uh, they are even rejecting Medtronic. Medtronic wants to work with them and they reject them like that. They create their spin-offs and they publish, uh, even in media, etc. And the web is in English now. Uh, Jan Hopkins, our friend Trianova, she went from having publications in Hindaway uh, to Milestones Nature Communications this year. This is a picture from this uh, milestone nature communications when you can see that she has the fibers wrong in the right ventricle, but it's a milestone paper. Um, and we see the BSC people, our friends, they went from having toothpaste award winning hearts, nice videos but completely unrealistic, to really being consulting, doing consulting work to Medtronic. So that's quite an improvement. And us, we went from UHeart to VP2HF. A lot of similar faces, and, but we passed from having eight retrospective patients in four years to now having one patient every two weeks done uh, in a prospective study. So that's quite an improvement. Uh, the objective of B2HF is quite similar, uh, but very important, a unique and single clinical software platform um, and using a wise uh, approach to decide where to use modeling or not. We don't need to use modeling for all patients. For easy patients, we already have data enough to see if the patient is going to respond or not, for instance, in CRT. So the more resource-intensive resource uh, uh, tools like modeling, they will be used just when they will add real value, and that's quite important. We have set up this kind of decision trees um, in order to have kind of this hierarchical management of the patient, and INRI people and KCL people, they have worked a lot to have this workflow where the patient arrives to the hospital, image data is acquired, and then in two weeks they have a really nice, uh, well, I will show you later, well, here, wait, here, a really nice report where uh, in this report the clinician can see the results of the simulation, the results of different decision trees looking at different parameters and some recommendation. In fact, this first step here in terms of the decision trees, it looks at the clinical guidelines, it looks at more advanced imaging parameters, and for cases that with data is not enough, the system recommends go for modeling, and then you do modeling, and the modeling will give an answer. So a lot of, uh, we've done a lot of uh, kind of development work through the Rocket app uh, in order to integrate into a single platform all the different tools. It was brilliant work of Carlos Agora, a developer in our lab, together with INRIA people uh, and together with clinicians. Uh, so this is kind of one snapshot of this tool that the clinician can look around uh, the whole database of images and, and data available for each patient. Okay. Uh, okay, I will just go quickly. So take home messages. So the field is improving a lot, but really a lot. 
clinicians really start to be interested on simulations. They want to know what they are. We have better data. We have better computational resources. I just, I think, I mean, my team was uh, still in me, the, the conclusions, like trying to be integrative, try to talk with different people or people with different profiles, biologists, uh, clinicians, uh, computer scientists, uh, modelers, experimentalists, etc., and do it before starting anything. Uh, whenever you have a clinical question, try to design everything and start to talk with people. And trying to go for a more systems biology multi-scale approach to solve clinical questions. You really need it. Uh, the other thing is that go simpler, as simpler as possible. Don't try to overcomplicate your tools because it's nice. Uh, well, this guy said a lot of things, but some not. Uh, and, uh, well, just thanks a lot of... Uh, the gangs we have around, kind of Fison's group and our brother group Symbiosis that you will know a bit more now. And the partners from European projects, national project funding agencies, clinicians, and a lot of other colleagues nationally and internationally. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Oscar, for this. Elaborate overview, extremely complimentary to Maxim's while you said like, I have nothing new to say. One of the nice things also that I think is important, maybe you can put your computer ready. One of the nice things that uh, you said is important is, okay, keep it simple, but not too simple neither. Because one of the things that you clearly showed is that, okay, I mean, you're not a model developer, but you start to use models and then you see that at some point you want to answer a clinical question. And then you say like, okay, there's something strange. So the question is then, what do you do? Do you say like, okay, this clinical question, I'm not gonna address it. Or do you say like, no, maybe we should go and look for the problem and then try to find the solution more deeply? I think you need both things. I mean, it depends. I mean, th there is a lot of work for a lot of people. So it's very useful people that don't do patient-specific modeling to better understand how the models work. I mean, we know uh, BSC people have been doing this for years. Uh, or other people doing more basic science, and it just no one can do everything. So I mean, it's just a matter of just trying to to have complementary work uh, and just put the things together, uh, and and just this work of kind of uh, just evangelizing the clinicians. Well, we know that is very hard, uh, and even papers like our friend uh, Natalia. Uh, to some extent, it's helping uh, because this works even if some people don't believe fully on, on them. Uh, they are showing simulation results to clinicians and they are kind of starting to be aware of it. So I think you need both and not try to oversell everything and, and say that you have solved everything. And some people do that, unfortunately. And how do you go from, you talk to a clinician and you say, I have my model that will solve your problem. And then at some point you're doing carpaccios in order to look at scars. Like uh, well, this was an idea of a clinician indeed. Because they couldn't, well, they wanted to have proof that what they see microscopically, uh, you see similar things at the histological level. And in fact, it was very funny because the anatomist, that he is all days looking at the histology and the carpaccio, uh, the first time he saw the uh, MR of the patient, he said, no, this is not possible. You are not guiding the ablation with this. I mean, you don't see anything here. And it has been after some time doing the 3D reconstruction of the histological data and put it together with the in vivo data that he starts to believe that what well, is not too, too bad, the in vivo MR data. But you really need to work a lot on how to present things to kind of the different specialists and, and how to you talk with them. So, yeah, so again, like Maxim said, is you need to couple different people from different backgrounds. And in a lot of cases, as kind of a VPH researcher, you have to be in between and try to find the right resources in order to get it done. Okay. Some other questions for Oscar? Well, thank you, Oscar, for the uh, great presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask you, um, do you find it really relevant to, uh, I mean, the, the scar information you obtain from CARTO, or do you think uh, there may be some other better predictors, let's say, for 
uh, certain arrhythmias, for example? Well, for, for VT is, is crucial because, I mean, there are uh, kind of heterogeneities or conduction channels that are too small to be seen uh, at the resolution of the imaging. And the clinicians, electrophysiologists, uh, until very recently, what they've done all their lives is to look at 1D signals. Uh, and in fact, this is what they, they use to detect this kind of double potentials or fractured, fractionated electrograms. Uh, and this is done with the CARTO data. It's not even the 3D reconstruction, this map, but to look at every acquired point, the signal, the 1D signal. That's why it's very, very important to have better signal processing. And these days it's awful. They just detect the maximum peak uh, at every point. And, and this is completely nonsense. There is huge room for improvement there. And then how to couple this together with the imaging information. I mean, you can imagine a, a really nice system where the preoperative information is going to guide you the acquisition of the different cart of points and doing together in an integrated way the signal processing uh, and just to detect inconsistencies between of the MR data and of the CARTO data as well. I think you need to, to have both. And with the new electroanatomical uh, systems where you can have thousands of points, you really need to go for advanced signal processing and how to couple with, with the MR. Another question is AF and the atria, where Fibrosis in the atria, well, niano, niano, niano. It's, well. Partially related to that also, I think one really important thing is by the fact that you work with all these different people and you have your way of presenting something or modeling something, you always have to translate it into a way that people are used to work with. That means that if you show electrophysiological modeling to an electrophysiologist, make sure you put 1D signals next to it because they're not necessarily going to understand the things that you like because they've never been using to, uh, used to working with it. So I think that's important, is do these translations, not only talking the same language, but also showing the same data, even if you're not convinced that's the best way of doing it, but they have so much experience in it, <coughs> and pattern recognition is still the thing that people are the best at at this A moment. A very stupid example of this some weeks ago that it's quite hard to believe. We were showing results of the outflow track uh, of the right ventricle simulations to the electrophysiologist. And Ruben put some uh, views of the 3D model and they didn't know where was the right ventricle and the left ventricle and the outflow track and is this the aorta? And they were asking to us because this wasn't the standard views where they, they have to look at the data. And they were, we are going to stop working with you if you don't put us the 3D model in the right orientation. Okay, thank you very much.